my name is Margie Brenner and I work at the Wind Energy Center at University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm speaking today with Professor James Manuel and he is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the founding director of the university's Wind Energy Center. Professor Manuel has been working in the field of wind energy for more than 35 years, both within the United States and internationally. His research interests have focused on the assessment of the wind resource and wind turbine external design conditions, hybrid power system design, energy storage, and offshore wind energy. He worked with the International Energy Agency's Wind Energy Research and Development Activity, Annex 7, which dealt with autonomous wind systems, and in conjunction with that activity, was a contributing author to the book, Wind Diesel Systems, a guide to the technology and its implementation. He has been and continues to be a member of the International Electrotechnical Commission's working groups, which have been developing design standards for offshore wind turbines since 2001. He's an author of the textbook, Wind Energy Explained, Theory, Design, and Application, and Offshore Wind Energy, Technology Trends, Challenges, and Risks in the Encyclopedia of Sustainability, Science, and Technology, as well as numerous other publications on various aspects of wind energy. Thank you for speaking with us today, Professor Manuel. All right, well, starting in the beginning, I guess I was in the Boy Scouts for uh, many years and uh, uh, did quite a lot of things there, kind of on the environmental side of things. So one of the more striking uh, experiences I had was uh, uh, canoeing down the Cuyahoga River uh, just about the time that it caught fire. And so that got me thinking about uh, environmental uh, issues at a uh, fairly early age. Um, from then, um, I spent a year abroad uh, in England and got a lot of experience in a whole variety of things uh, in the mid-1960s, uh, including uh, interest in uh, nautical archaeology, which turns out to have a close tie into offshore wind energy, which came later. In the 1970s, I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, issues of, of the environment uh, uh, and energy and the benefits or lack thereof of nuclear power. And uh, I guess I came to learn or believe that it wasn't such a good idea. And oil and gas also were, became very problematic uh, during the oil crisis of the, the, the mid-1970s. So uh, I had been uh, wandering around in multiple departments um, at UMass and then uh, including electrical and computer engineering uh, and chemical engineering. And then I stumbled uh, in, into mechanical engineering because of that was the time when the department was first building a wind turbine uh, that was known as the uh, Wolf One, Wind Furnace One. And it seemed that the projects I was working on were always put into the back of the line because the wind uh, furnace uh, was being built. So I thought, well, actually that was a lot more interesting and so I went and introduced myself to uh, Bill uh, Hieronymus, who was the founder uh, of the activity at, at that time, uh, wind energy, uh, uh, ocean thermal energy. And um, so I got to meet him. And then I met uh, uh, John McGowan, uh, who was there at the time, who's still here. And um, I said, well, that I, th I think I belong here rather than where I was. So I, uh, I moved over to uh, mechanical engineering. I, you know, I liked it because it was a challenge. Uh, there, uh, there was a uh, good reason to do things and uh, it was challenging to do it. My, my background was not in engineering originally. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in uh, biophysics from Amherst. Well, for many years I taught, I taught thermodynamics which doesn't sound like it has to do with wind energy, but it is kind of the fundamentals uh, underpinning uh, of a lot of energy, well, of all of, all of energy, uh, and really the application of physics to kind of the real world. Uh, other courses that I've taught um, include solar energy, and uh, which uh, that's evolved a lot uh, since I first started in terms of wind energy uh, specifically. Uh, I've taught the, the fundamental wind energy course for I don't know how many years now. Uh, it had the same number when I took it, uh, 573, and I took it 
probably in 19, I don't know, 76 or 77 or something like that. Uh, wind turbines have evolved so much uh, in, in the interim, it's, it's, it's actually hard to believe how, how much they have evolved. And so my, the course has evolved. It's been quite a ride from, uh, uh, from when I started, uh, when I took that course the first time, to now trying to, trying to keep introducing new things uh, that have happened since, but, um, uh, but without forgetting the fundamentals uh, of how it all works. Uh, a number of us over the past couple of years put together a new course, which I, I now teach, MIE 673, which has kind of consolidated itself into what I call wind turbine uh, design. So we really get into the, into the details of uh, how turbines are built and how they're analyzed and, and whatnot. We use a lot of the, of the computer codes that were developed by the Nash, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, as well as some that are developed here at UMass. We try to keep up, and even that's a challenge with the, um, uh, uh, the evolution of, of turbines today and how to analyze them. So the, the design course is a lot more challenging, but it's a lot of fun uh, because, uh, because it is challenging. Uh, we also had a course uh, for a couple of years in offshore wind energy. Um, so that's also a lot of fun. There's a whole lot of uh, aspects of, wind, of offshore wind energy that are unique compared to uh, just wind turbines in general. Fundamentally, it has to do with how you're going to support these uh, wind, wind turbines out, uh, uh, out in the ocean. Uh, so they don't, uh, well, they're either supported on the ocean floor or nowadays uh, uh, they're floating, uh, which is another fascinating, relatively new topic, uh, but a concept that was invented at UMass uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, in, in the days that people just thought, that this was just totally outlandish. I have to say that you couldn't possibly float a, a wind turbine, um, but of course you could. Wind energy now is, is one of the major sources of new energy for the world. And, and to have sort of gone through that whole process where pretty much nothing worked, uh, everything was small and broke all the time. Uh, mm -hmm to the point where uh, we are today is, is amazing. I guess that's, that's the most amazing. And of course, all along the way in the beginning, uh, when I was a grad student, a lot of students I worked with went on to work in all kinds of areas of, of the wind energy field. And that's been, been a lot of fun to maintain uh, the connection with them over, over the years. And uh, you know, seeing their paths through the evolution of, of wind energy as well. And then more recently, uh, still a lot, a lot of our students do continue to go into the field of, of wind energy, and that's great. Uh, a lot of them then come back and, you know, they send me notes or whatnot, and that's always nice. You know, in terms of projects, uh, maybe that's another way to, to view, you know, how I look back on this. As we've been involved here at UMass in some really interesting activities. It started before I joined the department with this building of this wind turbine, uh, the Wind Furnace One which is now in storage in, in the Smithsonian. Uh, hopefully it's going to become an exhibit at some point, but uh, that was an amazing project. Uh, you know, and I, I got to, to be involved with it, not in its first design, but uh, in its operation and analysis and, and whatnot. That was su such an amazing turbine because it, it can be really considered the world's first modern wind turbine in, in many ways. I don't know if we all realized it then to what degree it was it was there at, at the beginning, but in, in many ways it was. It, uh, it had fiberglass blades, which was pretty unusual. Uh, the blade uh, angles of, could be changed uh, with the wind speed, both to help the turbine start or to control it in high winds. Uh, it had variable speed operation. Uh, it was computer controlled, which I think was truly amazing for something out of in, in that era. You know, I, I look back on that project and, and I just sometimes I can't believe that that was built and designed by, by UMass students, you know, in, in the 1970s. And they it actually, it actually worked. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that turbine, that was uh, the predecessor of, uh, of a company called U.S. Wind Power. And uh, then U.S. Wind Power uh, moved to California and uh, built the first real wind farms in the, in the world. Uh, that were uh, connected to the grid. And the very first turbines looked a whole lot like the one that was built here at UMass because a lot of the 
people who worked at Free U.S. Wind Power had graduated from UMass and had worked on that, that turbine. So, uh, you know, things move on and uh, turbines don't look quite like those did, but they, a, there's still a lot that grew out of that experience that you can still see in the, in the world today. So that's pretty interesting. I think that maybe the most significant next big thing uh, in, in my career was kind of the return into offshore wind energy. I mentioned previously that, that offshore was invented as a concept, a serious concept at UMass in the early 1970s, when it was really impossible to have implemented it, quite honestly. The turbines couldn't possibly have survived in the offshore environment, and nobody really had any idea how to put it all together. But the vision that uh, was there, uh, it was certainly a reasonable vision, it made a lot of sense. It's just a question of the technology kind of try, trying to catch up. You know, on and off, and even in extending into the 80s, 1980s, I had worked with uh, Professor uh, uh, Hieronymus on some conceptual concepts. So we had hoped they would become more than conceptual, uh, but they were pretty interesting uh, in any case, and none of them got built, but they, uh, they I think they, they showed that things could have got built. I think the one thing I forgot to mention is the turbine that we put up on Mount Tom, which was really a great project, uh, tremendously informative. There's nothing like the real working with a real, real hardware uh, to give you real experience. And, and at that point, the company that had built the turbine originally was out of business. So we didn't have to worry about uh, intellectual property or patents or anything. And we could and had to fix everything that went wrong. And all the students who were involved, including myself, uh, not a student at that point, but uh, we all learned an enormous amount uh, on, on that project. Uh, some of what I like to see is already happening, uh, namely that uh, wind, it really wind energy and solar photovoltaics are, are the future of, of, of the world's energy supply. And so the things I like to see going on are what I've been talking about, I think, all along. The whole integration of, of wind energy and solar and the energy supply with energy storage and hydrogen production and, and, and things like that. So maybe I don't have to do anything. Maybe I can just sit back and watch at this point. But it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting to see that. I just, just a couple of days ago was a blurb about some, a project in Scotland. It, it has, uh, it's an ongoing project involving floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, making hydrogen, you know. So I looked at that and I said, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unbelievable. The next frontier, well, is integrated thinking, I guess, in, in many ways. Um, you know, just like, as I said, in the beginning of modern wind energy, people thought it was kind of the aerodynamics and it turns out that, yeah, aerodynamics is part of it, but it's by no means uh, all of it. On the one hand, there are many specialties that are required. No one person can really conceivably know everything. On the other hand, you have to be aware or understand how these pieces all fit together or you can't make anything work either. So it's a challenge 